ladies and gentlemen good morning welcome and thank you for attending this training webinar by dr thomas pakowski dr pakowski works in vienna austria and has performed more than 1080 cases procedures to date dr pakowski uses three different capsule endoscopy systems and i'm proud to say that he has used capsocam plus for 66 percent of his 348 patients in 2019. He is well experienced to talk about the various capsule systems. Along with Dr. Pakowski, we also have Dr. Alexei Kornev from Crimea, Russia, who will be presenting a case on Crohn's disease diagnosis during this COVID-19 times. Today's webinar is for 90 minutes. Please keep your microphones muted when you are not talking because there are a lot of uh, folks here. We have about 200 people registered. Please close your videos if you're not presenting as it will take serious bandwidth. We have 15 minutes for question and answers at the end of the session. Please save your questions for the end. You can either ask your questions or you can type in your questions on the Q&A uh, on the bottom along with the participants list and other things or you can ask at the end of the session. Please note this webinar is recorded and will be passed on to all the registered attendees and our distribution partners after the event. Once again, on behalf of Capsovision, I welcome you all and thank you for attending this uh, event. And over to you, Dr. Pakowski. Thank you. Hello, good morning from Vienna. And we have a new design of our online course and I will show you what we will do in the next 90 minutes. We will first start with a small system over overview. I will show you how the software is working, how to start uh, reporting a case. Then we will skip to the indications. We start with GI bleeding and iron deficiency anemia. I will show you after a short introduction four cases where we will describe also again the software and the features you can use. Then we go on with Crohn's disease, then celiac disease and polyposis syndromes and the end is then with tumors and metastasis. For all these, I will present you three to four cases to show you pictures, how you can, can give the reporting, how you can find the pathology. And at the end, as Srini told us, 15 minutes for question and answers. So what do we need to perform a capsule study? First, we need the capsule. You know, the capsule plus now is a very good product. We have a size from 11 by 31 millimeter, four cameras, so we have a 360 degree panoramic view we have more than 220,000 pixels, a frame rate up to 20 frames per second, 16 LEDs so we can see everything good, 20 hours recording time, a totally wire-free technology, everything is stored on board on a one gig gigabyte memory and we have an optical interface to transfer the data to our capsule access. I will show you after this. What do we need more? We need a patient and a patient with a good indication. So what are the indications for a capsule endoscopy? Is the mid GI bleeding after upper and lower GI endoscopy, the iron, deficiency anemia, 
after a total broke up, you can find the reason. Big issue for Crohn's disease, polyposis syndrome, suspected tumor or metastasis, and the refractory celiac disease. So a patient with one of these indications and we can start. How will we start? To proceed, I will show you how we perform capsule endoscopy in my unit. We tell the patient to eat the last time at 5 p.m. the day before the examination. Then they came to the hospital at 8 a.m. They get one liter pack solution to drink in our unit. After drinking, they can swallow the capsule immediately. Then they're allowed to drink water and they're allowed to eat after four hours. After excretion, they bring the capsule back to the hospital and we can then download and create the report. So that's the standard procedure, but now at the moment, you see we have for the COVID situation and the total lockdown, we have some problem. We need the patient in the hospital and after excretion, we need the patient to bring back the capsule. And the capsule cam system has here a new feature to make it better and secure in these days. So we have the contact-free telehealth coupled with the capsule cloud. The capsule cloud offers with the capsule cam plus the solution for a total contact-free telehealth device. The swallowing and retrieval of the capsule will be at home by telehealth consultation with the doctor even if this is a call or a video call, you can tell the people how to do it and visit them during that. The retrieved capsule can be sent by mail or from a download center. The video is uploaded to the capsule cloud and from the capsule cloud, you can do the reporting. The cups in the capsule cloud included is the software. So you only need a computer with internet access. You go to the capsule cloud and you can do your work from there. And the patient doesn't come to you. You can it by telehealth service. So I told you we need the capsule back so you get the or the patient get the capsule retrieve system with a pan for the toilet and the magnetic wand to catch the capsule. We have the small vial where we will get back or the download center will get back the capsule. Then the capsule will be downloaded over the capsule access. We have an optical interface, a download time of 30 to 40 minutes, and that's the fastest download of all our available capsule systems. So you can get the data very easy to your computer or to the capsule cloud and you can start immediately with the reporting. And you need the software. You can work on every computer you work with. It could be also a Mac or a Windows-based computer or over the, the capsule cloud where the software is included. So, we have now a couple of months a new software, the 3.5 software. And what's new in this software? We have now a landmark 
suggestion. So the system will show us some pictures with the landmarks. And it is now easier to find the first of all these pictures because it's nearby to the suggestion. Sometimes it's the, the real first picture of the stomach or the duodenum or cecum. Sometimes it's nearby, but it's a help and it makes it easier to, to put your landmarks. You can make short clips, you can crop images so you can highlight the, the main pathology and you can export the video is AVI, so you can look at the video with every, every software and you don't need even the CapsuView software. And as I told you, you can also use it on Mac and it's the only Capsule software at the moment you can use on Mac. So Mr. Srini told you and I will will only highlight here the last year, 2019, we are now at 65.8% of usage of the capsule can because it's the easiest way for us to perform capsule endoscopy with a really good uh, performance and with very good results. We have now done more than 3,300 examinations and 1080 with the capsule cam and some 722 with the capsule cam plus system. So our data over, over the last years, only 21 patients lost their capsule means 2.5%. No technical problems with the capsule cam plus. We had some problems with the, the first generation, some with the second, but the Capsulcam Plus is a very stable system without any problem. We have now an examination time of 20 hours, so it is really a, enough time. Yeah? You don't need the 20 hours in most of the cases, but it's good to know if we have a kind of stenosis where the capsule can't pass as as fast as you like it. Uh, if you have a, a longer time in the stomach for three or four hours, you can lose time. And with the other systems, often you can't reach the cecum. With the capsicum, we have a colon reach rate of more than 97%. So here are only those cases excluded, which, which are very, very seldom. Reading time, it's also fantastic with the dual mode and I will show it then with the explanation of the software. We have 15 to 20 minutes to report. So overall, we have a loss of data because of the, the first two generations with technical problems and lost capsules of 3.1% and we have in the same period with the end view systems, a data loss of 6% because of defect sensor belts, data recorders or capsules. So then I think I will, will start with the first session with the GI bleeding and the iron deficiency anemia. And then we go on with the software and the, the cases. The mid-GI bleeding, over years it, it was really, really hard to, to find the, the bleeding source. We performed upper and lower GI endoscopy, we can't find the bleeding source. We made angiography, maybe um, um, a scan, a bleeding scan, but now with the, with the capsule endoscopy, we can visualize the entire small bowel. So this is also the most common indication for the capsule endoscopy. 
we have to think about five to 10% of all GI bleedings are a mid GI bleeding. The mid GI bleeding had a low mortality, but we have a high frequency of recurrence. So we know we have the patient inside, it stops bleeding, but he will come back over the next month again. So I will show you this because we have here for three um, groups of, of patients, uh, the main results, the main etiology of the, the gastrointestinal bleeding. And you can see that we have for the, for the elderly person uh, for over 65 years, we have vascular anomalies, small intestinal ulcers, even often the cause of NSAID enteropathy, we can find some small tumors. The nonspecific enteritis, with every kind of enteritis, you also can, can bleed. And sometimes also a celiac disease, but often the celiac disease you can find in the younger ones. And here in the younger ones, it's very necessary also to think about the Crohn's disease, the macular diverticulum, it's not a typical, typical capsule endoscopy pathology, but you can find it. I've found over the years a couple of, of macular diverticulums. And we have often duelar foie lesions, and the vascular lesions are for all the older ages the same. I will show you here only short a, a, a retrospective analysis of 76 studies where they have located the bleeding source and it's necessary to know because then we also have to, to think to do a second upper GI endoscopy. You will find 26.7% in the duodenum. 40% tilted right ligament, 23% in the jejunum, and then the rest. But if you look at this, we will find 66% of the bleeding sources tilted the right ligament. And on the next slide, I will show you the algorithm how we perform or how we go on with the mid GI bleeding. We try to do upper GI endoscopy on the admission day, lower GI endoscopy if necessary. Also, if we can't find anything at the upper GI endoscopy, we change to another longer endoscope to go as far as possible to the small bowel. If this is negative, here you have the second look, upper GI endoscopy, but it's most of the times at the same, same time. And then we go on with the capsule endoscopy. Then we have the way, if we find a positive bleeding source and then intervention by enteroscopy is possible, we go on with enteroscopy. Without possible intervention, we go on with angiography or contact the surgeon. If this is then if we can't find anything and it's an ongoing bleeding, we go on with enteroscopy. If the bleeding has stopped, we wait. And if there's a new bleeding, we go on with the enteroscopy. So that's the algorithm of my unit. Then I will show you some, some pictures. We have here now an angiodysplasia. Here the same, a lot of in a patient with an Osler's disease. Then some ulcers. You can't say from the picture, even it's an NSAID ulcer or a vasculitis or a Crohn's disease. So you need the history of the patient. So, and with this, 
Now we will start with our first cases in this session. And I will show you here the, the software. It's a quite easy software and I think all you can see will, will be quite easy. You have here a folder to open the video or you go on with this. So I can click here and I have here my videos I have prepared for our online course and I will start now with this. And you can see here now a lot. We have a blue color for the first part of the, of the examination. It's the stomach, then those yellow for the small bowel and the green will be for the for the colon. You have here only a few buttons to play forward. You can go back. You can go back step by step and also the same. You can go forward step by step. You have here the, the contrast adjustment. So you can, if you need it a little bit sharper, you go, go up. You can also arrange the color as you like it for your eyes. We have here the, the color enhancement with some, some pre presets can sometimes be helpful if you can't say, is this an ulcer or is it some stool? We have here a rat detection. We have built in the reference library. You can take some photos and say, okay, that's the first picture of the esophagus, the gastric duodenal and cecal. We can set some some marks if you like we can give here an arrow and we have also included the reporting software we can here create a report and if you say now okay my report is ready you will get the pdf file and you can send it by mail, you can store it, you can print it, whatever you want. As you can see here on the right side, I have some, some thumbnails of pathologies and of the, the landmarks. You can include them also in the report and Here you can say select all, then all of your pictures, all of your thumbnails will, will come to the report. So when, when I start with a, with a new, we make it better. So if we, I start with a, with a new case, I first go in, we don't have any color because we have then the, the estimated lesson marks and we can, can easily find our landmarks. And if we have this, I click here in and I go on very, very slow and go down because I want to see immediately, do we have a severe bleeding? Can I find some, some blood with this? And you get really a quite good overview. If you look at the screen, you will see, yes, there are some angiodysplasia, so we can, can find here, here some pathologies. But this first screening is only to look if there a really severe um, pathology I can find with this. Here's now some stool. You can also see some, some blood, not so, not so much. And here, now we are in the, in the CCAM and here you can also see 
we have here an angular dysplasia in, in this area in the cecum. So, so that's how I'm starting. Then I'm going back, then I help me with the suggested landmarks and we will now go on here with the first duodenum. Yes, I want to show you also the, the dual mode. The dual mode is a, is a quite good mode. You can change here from the panoramic to the, to the dual mode. And you have here now two lines and those two lines make it quite easy easy to look. It needs some, some time to get familiar with this kind of view. And so for, for today, I will go back to the, to the panoramic. But with this, you can reduce the reading time to a very, very good time and you can, can report within 15 minutes. So we will go on with the first picture of the two genome and then I'm going on. You can see we have here uh, first pathology, we have an angle dysplasia. And as you see at the moment, I let go it very, very slow. We have the, the slowest frame rate. And we can see here another one, here maybe a small spot. So we have really some pathologies and we know what the cause of the, here another one, of the, the bleeding is. Yeah. If you, you find something like that, you can make a photo and you will find your photo here at the site and if we have now this pathology and you are not sure what kind of pathology this is we can go on with the with the library and here you will find a lot of of other pathologies You can, can sort it by the diagnosis. You can, can go on with your video if you go with your arrow here inside and you can go forward and back and you can scroll here in this. And I think you will agree if we make it bigger here we have an angle dysplasia and in our video now I've lost it but you've seen it you know it here again we have it so it can be helpful but I'm sure most of you are so experienced so that you can see what's going on and name the pathologies then we have here some other issues this you need when you have to download a, a video here to save it here you can export the video only maybe a small number if you you know the pathology is within the range of of the picture numbers 300 to 500 we can say okay we want to do this we can de-identify it so you won't send the name if you need a second opinion for a small video for a lesion. You can include your annotations of this. So you will get a short video with the thumbnails in this, this range you have. If you now go to export the video, it will create this, this video you can choose your path where you should store it. So that's what the software can. We can also go on 
with a higher frame rate. If you have a, a very good view, you can, can use it to, to go faster downwards. It depends what you're searching for. If you want to find the bleeding, maybe you can go on faster. Here you can see we have some fresh blood in this area. We can go up to five times. So you can see it's, it's, really, it's really fast. I think for this you have to be very, very experienced. For me it's too fast. I have not enough experience to go on with this. So I prefer two times or 2.5. That's my, my preferred um, speed to look at the, at the video. You will get in, in your color bar here inside, everywhere you have a thumbnail, those white lines. So you can easily know, okay, we go here, we are in front of one of these lines. And if I'm going on here with that, there must be, and here we have one, there must be the pathology. And here another one. So this was the first case, many angular dysplasias in, in the small bowel for a patient with an ongoing bleeding. Then I will show you the next case. We have the same, you've seen it. We go to open the video from the folder or here in front. And here we have now the same situation. We have the blue color for the stomach. We have the yellow color for the small bowel. And in this case, I will click here inside and you can see we have here a lot of stool and if we go on, you can see we, we have not reached the cecum. Yeah? And if we go back a little bit, you can see the, the cause of this because we have here, and I, I will start from, from here and, and go on back. You can see we have here uh, edema of the willy. You can see we have a bleeding. We have some stool, so it's a bad quality in this area. And if we go to the thumbnails, we can maybe here see, see the cause and I will, will show it to you here in front because we have here in this area a stenosis. The capsule can pass through after the examination, so it was not a capsule intention in this patient, but for this case in this 20 hours, or it, it, this is an older, older capsule, in this, this area we had only 12 hours recording time. So for 12 hours, it's not gone through, but you have seen now why the, the preparation is so bad in this area, because here you can see we get more and more stool. And we will go on now here near the area we have the, the first lesion, because we have here a lot of, of lesions with a different character. And I will show you that. So maybe we will go on a little bit, a little bit faster. So I will first show you the, the pathologies and then I will tell you what is the reason for, for this, what we will find. So, and here we can see it not quite good, but we will get it much better. And here 
you can see the first we have here also a stenosis we have here an ulceration we have here a narrowing of the of the lumen and we can can go on but at this this time the the capsule can go through this is not the the main the main narrowing and the stenosis you can see we have here a lot of of pictures yeah if we have a stenosis the capsule can't go through it will swim till the narrowing then go a little back and come again and so we have often this situation that we have a lot of of pictures of the same stricture because the, the capsule is going on and going back and come back again to to this so if we look here to our to our thumbnails i can can show you a little bit so we have here now another kind of also we go to the panoramic mode yeah we've seen this was another kind of of also we have seen than than before but we also can see here in this area look at that we have here also a kind of inflammation we have more fluid inside of the villi so this is not the, the typical picture of the small bowel. And we will go on here. Again, we have severe ulceration in this area. You can see it even only, only a few pictures, then it's gone. But here, if we look at that, we can also see here an ulceration. And then it's going on. Here was also an ulceration. So if we look at, at the thumbnails, we can see that we have a huge number of ulcerations. And this is a kind of an NSAID enteropathy. And with large ulceration with a stricture where the capsule can't go by and where we can see also a lot of inflammation here again ulceration and sometimes it's quite hard because you you can't you can't uh, say is this now a new lesion or is this the same lesion from another side you have another angle of the picture so it's sometimes quite hard to say is it this but here again you can see the inflammation and the edematous really in this this area so this is our our second case and look at the thumbnails if we have any other sign in this but i think that's it those are the the main pathologies of this case and so we will go on with the next case in the bleeding session And here in this, I have not marked the, the first picture of the stomach. So I think here we are now in the, in the esophagus. So we can say we have here the first esophagus picture. 
then we will go on and I think you will agree with me that we have here now the junction and here we are inside of the stomach. So we go here and say yes, that's the first gastric image. And if we look here to our thumbnails with the first esophagus, gastric and duodenal picture. And we can go on with our work and we will start going down. And you can see if you look here downstairs in the in the color bar, yeah, we have some signs over the whole small bowel. And here also one in the in the cecum or in the colon. And if we're going here close to the first mark, I will show you now another kind of ulcer. It is so difficult to say what is the cause of the pathology you find. Yes, for the ulcers, it's really, really hard to say. You need the history of the patient. You need maybe some blood tests uh, to, to find out what's going on. You need the medication of the patient. And you can see it's not very clear, but here is an area, it looks different than the rest, yeah? So, if you see this first, you, you will say, okay, I don't know what's going on. But here we have a second one. It's also not so clear. It's because the capsule is near to the, to the mucosa. So that's why in this area you can't see really, they are flattened by the capsule. But you can see here, there is something, it, it looks not healthy. So we will go on and you can see we have here another area, we have here another area which looks not as you, as you think a small bowel has to look at. And if you're going down, the situation will be clearer because we get a lot of this pathologies. So I'm going on a little bit faster so we can, can reach the better area. Here we have one. You can see we have here an ulceration. The, the villi in this area are gone. We have a kind of, of inflammation. So we will go on a little bit faster. And so we, we have here another one. And that's what we can, can find everywhere here, everywhere. We have from the distribution of, this, of these lesions, we have it in the entire small bowel. Maybe the ileum is spared out without any any more of this, this pathology of this ulcer. And we have areas, there's nothing. We have areas here with the next ulcer. The rest of the, of the mucosa is quite well. We don't have a severe inflammation in this area but I will show you another area because here we are in the jejunum everything is okay piece of uh, if you look at, at those ulcers but if we go down you can see now now this and I'm sure we are also at 
the end of the jejunum, maybe it could be the first part of the of the aleum. Sometimes it's also hard to say to say where we are. And you can see here we have now a severe inflammation, we have big fat willy, we have a little bit of intramucosal bleeding, and we have ulcerations at all. So this is the area with the severe inflammation, a totally change of the of the mucosal of the mucosal wall, and you can see it's totally different from the rest. And if we go down here now in the hallium, you can see it's looking better, it's quite normal. So this was the, the first part and the first videos I want to show you. And I think we are good in time. So we will start with the next indication. And the next indication here is the Crohn's disease. And we always have a, a, a lot of discussions how useful is capsule endoscopy for the Crohn's disease. And I'm convinced that it's really, really necessary to perform it. So for me, the capsule endoscopy is the best examination to find early mucosal injuries. And we have to find the early mucosal injuries. You don't have any benefit if you have a severe inflammation, if you have a scarring in the small bowel. We have to treat our Crohn's patients in the early stations. Then when we can, can reduce the risk for fistulas, reduce the risk for stenosis. And that's why we have to, to find those early mucosal injuries. You have to take a very good look at the medical history of the patient. Please ask them, do you have pain? Pain is the main system. You have to, to think about the stricture or stenosis. So if the main system is pain, don't do capsule endoscopy, then use MRI, CD, whatever you can do, or even ultrasound. If the main system is not the pain, then perform a capsule endoscopy. We have now at the time many guidelines, every nationwide society has their guidelines and the why will to, to highlight the American guidelines because they are quite easy. They say, do a capsule endoscopy to evaluate the small intestine by suspected Crohn's disease with no obstructive symptoms. So if you think this is a patient after upper and lower GI endoscopy, with no result, but you think there could be a Crohn's disease, please then do a capsule endoscopy to look at the small bowel. And we have a big change in the statement of the echo. The echo, sometimes I thought the echo don't like capsule endoscopy but now they have changed their mind. And now we have also a good statement. And they say, if there is a clinical suspicion of Crohn's disease with normal endoscopy, perform small bowel capsule endoscopy. You can look even if you do a cross-sectional imaging, imaging, but you can do the capsule endoscopy. And they say also, all newly diagnosed Crohn's disease should undergo small bowel assessment. And here also, ultrasound, MRI, or the capsule endoscopy. So for me on my unit, the capsule endoscopy is the preferred examination way for the small bowel. And so we perform very often capsule endoscopy. So 
that's the rest from the from the the echo statements so they have changed their mind the years before they told us you have to do a capsule uh, an mri before performing capsule endoscopy you have to use a patency capsule before I do this that's gone it's over now we have also the statement from the echo just do capsule endoscopy for Crohn's disease and I will show you some pictures here very small erosions or aftoid lesions they can be ulcers here with a little stool but this is an ulcer here much bigger ulcers with also inflammation in this area severe edema because of the inflammation and here really also big fat villi and if you look at this picture and you remember the the last picture of of the of the NSAIDs, you will say, hey, it's look the, like the same. And that's it. Yes, it can be NSAID, it can be a tuberculosis, it can also be a Crohn's disease. So, and with these pictures, we go on with our cases for the second part. And here also our landmarks and we go on here and we will start immediately at the beginning of the of the small bowel. And you can see we have here some clusters of the of landmarks. Then there is a long period without anything, then again, then also, and at the end in the alleum, we have also a lot of, of pathologies. And so we will we'll go on. Here you can, can say this is his medication. Mesacran, it's called in a, a five other preparation. Mesacran is the, the name in, in my country of this medication. And we're going on a little bit faster. We have some bubbles here in, in this area. And we will we'll go on maybe with, with the landmarks to spare some time. And I will show you here this. You can see also here is a kind of inflammation. We have a small aftoid lesion. Here is the same. Here is another one. And we can find them, as I told you, in here. This is a, a place where, where the absolute lesion is healing, but without any, any villi in this area. You can see here, no kind of inflammation. Everything is okay, very small and fine villi in this area. Here, absolute lesion without villi around, a sign of inflammation. Here also, the bill is a little bit bigger than normally as sign of the inflammation and the, the reparation in this part of the, of the mucosa. So this is not a very severe Crohn's disease in the small bowel, but we have really a lot of 
of lesions and we have to treat this patient in a very good way so we can can come to a mucosal healing. So I will look because we have here many of those lesions and they are all very small. Maybe here more inflammation, bigger villus in this area, but overall you can say the rest of the mucosa is totally normal. Even we have here some stool, but we can see it and we are here in the ileum and in the terminal ileum we have a change. We have here bigger ulcers. We can't say, let just make it bigger. We can't say we have here a normal mucosa with those, those small villus at all, but we have here much bigger ulceration and now we are in the, in the, colon. So we will go on with the next case. Here you can, can see we have a totally normal upper small bowel. Here is nothing. We have a normal really without any kind of, of inflammation. And we will go on here with this, with the thumbnails. We have here a small lesion. And if we're going on, we can, we have another small lesion. So also very small lesion and you can't find this lesion with any other modality. You can't see it on CT scan, you can see it on ultrasound, not on MRI. What you will see is this inflammation in this area. We have here again a very big fat billy and you can see here in an MRI scan the thickened wall as as part of the of the inflammation in this area we have here an ulceration so in the terminal ileum we have a severe inflammation with big fat really a thickened wall but those small lesions from the from the unum you can see with another modality and i will also show you a third case of a Crohn's disease. Here you can, can also see the upper area of the small bowel is totally healthy, no problem at all, nothing to say. And then we've seen it here, we will so we go to the panoramic mode. I think it's easier for you. We have here a small lesion. And if we look at the thumbnails, I will show you some others here, a small lesion. Then in this area, we will find a bigger ulceration with other lesions nearby. Here, this and here, big ulceration in this area, but also without so much inflammation nearby. Here, bigger, deeper ulceration in this area. Really big ulceration now here. And then also here a stricture, but 
in this video, it is the same that capsule can't go through during the examination time, but there was also no retention. You can see here the inflammation with the big fat willy here in this area, but the capsule can go by and came out normally so we can, can do the reporting. I'm just looking here, ulcers, ulcers, ulcers. So this was the second part with the Crohn's disease and we go on with the refractory celiac disease and the polyposis. And in Austria, we don't perform so much um, capsule endoscopy for celiac disease, but even in, in Italy, there is a much bigger number but you can, can see, if you look at, at, the, at the card, you can see a lot of countries where it is. We have in the US and Mexico a risk up from 1 to 3.5% per 100,000 people. Brasilia, a big hotspot, India and Europe at all. So what's the problem with the refractory celiac disease? Those are patients with new symptoms with diet. Atrophy of really longer than one year if they have a good diet. And with this inflammation over the years, you get a change at the T cell receptor. And we have a high risk for T cell lymphoma. So that's the reason why we perform uh, caps endoscopy for celiac diseases with symptoms. And I want to show you some pictures. This is a quite easy, I think. You can see the scalloping folds. If you have seen one, you will recognize it the next time. And the second part in, in this, this session is the, the screening of, of Poitzegas syndrome. And this is the surveillance guide for Pitsegas patients who say for the small intestine capsule endoscopy or MRI within every three years. And so do we, we make first capsule endoscopy every three years. If we find some bigger polyps, we try to go on with enteroscopy and polybectomy. So some some pictures here, you have a pedunculated polyp. This is, you know, the head of this polyp. And we will go on with the cases. Here will be quite fast because it's so impressive and so easy to find. And then we go, go on with the last part. So you know, we have those changes even in the duodenum and the proximal part of the, of the small bowel. And this is a, a patient we have, we, we set the capsule by gastroscopy. This is a system from US endoscopy to place the capsule. Sometimes it's quite hard. The patient had a stenosis in the duodenum. So we had some injury, but we have some bleeding. And in this bleeding, it's quite easy to see those colloping folds. If you look at this, we have now with the bleeding a, a good contrast and we can see better the structure of the, of the small bowel. So I think it's, it's quite easy to see the difference of the, of the structure of the mucosa in this area than we have seen before in, the, in those, those other indications. So you can see these signs of the, of the celiac disease as it should be. So then I will show you the second case of celiac disease. 
it's also a, an older video, but the quality is not as good, but it's, and now we're going on with the, with the small bowel. And here in the small bowel, we can also find some, some polyps. You know, we will try to retrieve the bigger ones. We can't do a removal of all the, the juvenile polyps. Here you can see one of this, those small one. We perform enteroscopy and remove them if they are bigger than one centimeter. It's the same here in this area. And And in this patient, we, we have found no big one, only those small ones. So I think because of the time, I will, will go on with, the, with the, the last session for tumors and, and metastasis. So we can, can go on with some cases then. So why perform uh, capsule endoscopy for suspected tumors. You know, we have an incidence of 1.6% per 100,000 inhabitants. We find neoplasia in around 9% of all capsule endoscopies. For the time before we perform capsule endoscopy, we don't know even this rate. We have high risk groups. I showed you the, the Pilsikas but also the lymph syndrome, lymphoma, skin melanoma have a high rate. And also a lot of tumors can do metastasis in the, in the small bowel. And that's why we are searching for this. And I will give you some pictures here at all. We have here an adenocarcinoma in the proximal eunum. Here another one also in the genome, and I will show you two cases of, of melanomas in the small bowel. So after those cases, we will go on with question and answers, and then we also have a short presentation from Russia, but I will go on, I think, with two cases, and then I will will give up to Mr. Srini at all. So we will look at this. This was a young guy with a, with a, a small bowel bleeding with an iron deficiency anemia. And I will show you this because it's not a very, we will we'll stay with the dual mode and we, we go on. It is not very impressive, but I have performed after this a double balloon enteroscopy, and we have found a four centimeter tumor, and I hope all of you have seen it. And I will go back. We have it here, and now we go to the panoramic mode. This is the lesion with ulcerations on the on the top i can't tell you what kind of tumor it is because it's a brand new video we have done surgery last week and i'm still waiting for the histology of this tumor but it was a, a four centimeter large tumor in the proximal unum. you can see we have only a small number of pictures when to three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and that's it. Eight pictures, not so really impressive, but this is big tumor in the small bowel. And I think I will show you a last case for um, a metastasis. 
as you can see here, we will go on. Sorry, this is not the metastasis, this is another tumor, but I will show you this one. So, and we will start here. Some mucus in, in this area. We can go on a little bit faster. And here you can see this is mucus, but this is a solid tumor in this area or a metastasis here. You can see it much better. It's also an ulceration. And here, the tumor, this is a metastasis of a malignant melanoma, also a, a young guy nearby 30 years. You can see the, sorry, you can see here the, the black color of the melanoma, this area. But they are not every time really, really black. There, you can see all, all the colors, but here in this case, you can see it. And we have here the metastasis. And if we are going down, we will find some others. In this case, also, we, we have a, a lot of, of stool inside here, the tumor. And here also another part in this area. Here you, you can see only those, those melanomas came from under the surface, under the mucosa. And you can see here only this black color before they, they break through the mucosa. Here also without a mucosal defect in this area. And here others. So, and I think Mr. Srini, we have left half uh, 15 minutes and I think we should stop here for question and answers and also for our colleague from Russia. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pakowski. It's wonderful. Uh, I think let's open up for Dr. Kornev uh, to present uh, his uh, Crohn's case uh, data here. And once he's done, then we'll move over to the Q&A, if that's OK with you. Yeah. OK. Dr. Kornev, it's all yours now, please. Hello. Uh, how do you hear me? Great. Thank you. Uh, I'm glad to welcome. Uh, everyone and thanks for the invitation to speak uh, one moment I need to demonstrate oh uh, your screen I, I uh, cannot start demonstration because uh, previous demonstration is uh, still going okay How can I stop it? Uh huh. Oh, it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now we can see your screen now. Go ahead, please. Uh huh. Uh, do you see the presentation? Yes. Okay. Yes, please. Uh, I work as endoscopist in Crimea. Uh, we were also affected by the coronavirus pandemic, and it became extremely difficult for patients to seek uh, routine care. Uh, but we are looking for alternative solution, and uh, one of such uh, solutions is a remote study performed by the patient at home on his own, in accordance with the doctor's uh, recommendations. 
I remember very well this uh, emaciated patient uh, who came to me with the hope of excluding Crohn's disease. Uh, she was troubled by pain in all parts of abdomen, weight loss, low-grade fever, loose tools up to five times a day, sometimes with foam, nausea, and extraneous taste in the mouth. The first uh, signs of the disease were noted in childhood, when spontaneous attacks of diarrhea occurred, stopping on their own. She has become worse since uh, 2001, after undergoing surgery for a caustic cyst. Uh, shortly before the study, her fecal calprotectin level increased. I listened to the patient, gave her detailed instructions for preparation, issued the capsule, and filled out for the necessary uh, documents. The patient was prepared at home on her own, according to the written instructions issued uh, to her. Uh, when it came time to swallow the capsule, we were in telephone mode with her. Everything went smoothly. And after three days, I received the finished capsule to uh, by career. Uh, analysis of the study uh, takes place in a special program, CAPSIVIEW. I think that for most doctors it will not cause difficulties. Uh, let's look at the resulting images. Despite the fact uh, that the patient swallowed the capsule uh, while lying uh, on its side, we received 17 images uh, of the esophagus in seven seconds. In the stomach, uh, the capsule was uh, uh, a little less than four minutes and uh, gave us very clear images of the distal part of the stomach. Uh, look for pronounced erythema and uh, light, small white uh, spots. Such changes uh, often occur with HP gastritis, with uh, focal atrophy. In the small bowel, the capsule uh, was uh, 5 hours 10 minutes and gave us 9,233 images. Uh, my wife goes no, uh, not allow me to drink a lot of coffee, but uh, decoding the video capsule allows me to get two pleasures at once, from work and from a cup of fine coffee. So, in the jejunum, a uh, small diverticulum is clearly visible. Look uh, how clear and uh, um, sharp is image. Throughout the jejunum and delium, multiple afters, erosions, small ulcers, and scars uh, are visible. Here you see ulcers in jejunum, and here is two ulcers, one near to another. Uh, here you see uh, aftoid erosions in uh, uh, Ileum. Here is a single ulcer in uh, ileum and scar. This is a white scar after a previous ulcer. I included the most uh, revealing images in the report. So what did we get? Firstly, we saw multiple aftoid lesions and small ulcers all over the small bowl with uh, very clear and sharp images, which unfortun uh, unfortunately confirmed fears about Crohn's disease. A small diverticulum was found in jejunum. Signs of uh, HP gastritis with uh, focal atrophy were found in stomach. But most importantly, 
we have successfully completed the study remotely, which uh, in today's new reality is extremely relevant and in demand. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. I will be happy to answer any, any questions. Thank you, Dr. Kornev. And uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are open for questions now. Uh, I'm going to read uh, some of the questions which we got in the Q&A platform. And mm -hmm. uh, those in the attendees who have questions, please uh, press the raise hand button so we know that you have a question and we'll be happy to unmute you so you can ask the question to the presenters. Is that clear? Okay. So, Dr. Pakowski, this question is for you. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is from uh, Dr. Remo Petronin from Canada. Why do you use PEG solution right before the procedure? Any particular purpose? What if the capsule is retained? How to get the info? We questions? use. Yeah. We, we gave the, the PEG solution immediately for the examination to have more fluid inside. We need underwater pictures to have a good view on the, on the surface, on the mucosa. And so we've seen that for our uh, opinion, it's the best to give it very close to the, to the examination. After a feasting period of nearby 15 hours as we use it, you have a, a clear and clean a small bowel, and so we get more fluid inside. Okay. Next question. What cautions are needed due to the COVID-19 pandemic? Can, can you explain it to me what 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 cautions what cautions what precautions are needed due to the covid 19 pandemic both of you are doing procedures during the covid times what yeah. precautions are you taking for your patients and for yourself yeah it's at the moment we in austria we we had a, a close uh, shutdown for for nearby two months in these two months we we have reduced also capsule endoscopy to a minimum only for patients with an ongoing bleeding. We don't have done any examination for a not really, really severe indication. Yeah. Now we're thinking of and and as I, I told you with the with the capsule cloud platform, and we are also going on now with telemedicine, we try to, to explain the patient without coming to our unit. We try to do video conferencing. So we, we go on with, with telemedicine to, to get those patients not inside the hospital to give them more security and also for us. Thank you. And Dr. Kornev, how are you handling this? Um, uh, the same question about precautions. Yeah, about the precautions for the pandemic. Um, uh, we uh, change, um, choose only uh, patients with a lower risk of uh, coronavirus. Uh, we have recommendations and uh, we know um, the science that uh, say us that risk of coronavirus is low. It's, um, it is the first. The second is um, possibility to disinfect uh, this video capsule before uh, you put in is it uh, to the reader. So, uh, you can uh, disinfect it. 
with uh, solutions. Uh, so uh, this way uh, will uh, reduce uh, risk to infect uh, personnel of clinic with uh, coronavirus. Right, right. Thank you, thank you. The next question to you, Dr. Pakowski. Could you please explain in more detail how this particular software makes review faster? What is the difference compared to other capsules? The main issue is the, is the dual mode. With the dual mode, you can go on really quite fast. You have, you have, you can, can do it in, in half of the time because it's like you you would you would look to to two screens you get half of the of the of the examination in the upper line the other half in the in the second line and so you can get a very compact and and very fast look to the examination thank you thank you the next question again to you, Dr. Pakowski, if you want to email the small piece of video, does the receiver should have the software to review the emailed piece? No, it, it's, it's an API. It's compatible with every media player you use on every computer. So you, you don't need the special software. Thank you. The next question, does the software help to determine in which part of the small bowel the lesion is? No. No, none of the softwares can this at the moment. Yeah? Because it's, it's quite hard. It depends on how fast the, the, the capsule goes down. You can, you can only estimate where the capsule is, but the software can't help you with this. It needs a lot of a lot of experience. For me, it's a little bit easier because I do a lot of enteroscopy for all the patients with the pathology in the capsule endoscopy, so I can correlate the picture or the, the my estimation of the capsule endoscopy and then look by enteroscopy. I showed you those one case with the, the first tumor case where I told you it was in the, in the proximal unum. From the capsule I thought it was maybe near the, the ligament of trites, but it was much deeper. So it was hard to get there even from the capsule endoscopy I thought I will be there within 10 minutes with enteroscopy but it was really hard to get there because it was much deeper and so you can overestimate or underestimate where the, the capsule is. I think it's, it's the, the hardest thing to say the position of a lesion in the small bowel. Thank you. Next question. Uh, again, a specific one to you. Is it a particular reason why Capsulcam Plus was used for 66% of the 2019 exams? Why using different technologies? We, we have different technologies because there are some patients who can handle the Capsulcam. Even they have to, to look at the stool. They have to be uh, at home. It's, it's not so easy for every patient to, to look at the, at the capsule and to find it and bring it back. So that's one reason. The second reason is at the moment at all for severe bleeding, we use a, a recorder-based system because we can look while the examination is going on on the data recorder if we have if we have uh, an ongoing bleeding and 
for all the other cases where we don't have to to hurry up we use the capsulecam because for me we have the better results with this system thank you the next one is cymatigon of use to reduce the amount of bubbles do you recommend some kind of diet before the examination we try to hold it quite easy for the patient um, we say only the the feasting period and 5 p.m the day before but we we recommend no special diet and we don't uh, use simeticon for the examination i've seen over the the last now 17 years it makes not a big change in the quality of images you have some patients with bubbles with simeticon you have someone without simeticon i have not seen a, a change and a quite better image quality with or without it so we we don't use it okay what is your experience dr corniv do you use cymeticon thank you uh, i have not so big experience in video capsule endoscopy but uh, we use uh, cymeticon uh, we uh, use uh, such recommendations but um, we have uh, uh, no experience to how it's without Cymeticon. So uh, maybe with time, we will see. Okay, thank you. The next question, what can we say to doctors who want to use patency capsule? Is it necessary, Dr. Pakowski? For my opinion, no, it's not necessary. We've done now more than 3,300 capsules and I've done two time a patency capsule. So for me, it's without any use. Don't do it. If you want to, to spend some money to Medtronic, just use a, a patency capsule. I don't think that it's necessary. I think the, the best thing to know if there could be a stricture, yes or no, is to talk to the patient to make a good a history to look if is pain the major problem and that's better than a patency capsule okay again uh, uh, this question was asked earlier I'm repeating this if the capsule is retained how do you get the video if, if the capsule is, is retained we we can't uh, get the video. We have to to get the capsule because all of the data are stored there. So first, I would say if we had a, a capsule retention, wait and see. Wait. We have some patients who bring the capsule back after two or three weeks, sometimes after one and a half month. So often the the problem is solved on its own or even you will perform a enteroscopy and grab it with a basket or whatever device you have and after you have got the capsule back you can create the video but with this it's not so necessary because you have seen the small bowel in the area till the stenosis where you found the, the capsule but the video isn't lost, it's stored secure on the capsule, but you need the capsule to, to get the video. A yeah, question linked to this, uh, in your experience, how many capsules have been retained? It's a, it's a really, really small number. I can, I have to look, I have to look, uh, Mr. Srini, maybe you five, six questions. <laughs> I can't tell you at the moment because uh, we've done a, a really big series with 
um, for, for Crohn's patients with a number of more than 600 Crohn's patients with no patency capsule and with no, but now I found it, I found my paper, the abstract. I can tell you we have a retention rate that now only for, for Crohn's patients in 0.79%. Great, thank in this, you. In this case series, there are in, included 633 um, examinations and in this 633, we have five patients with a capsule retention, but those are only Crohn's patients. And I think for, for the rest, you can say it's nearby 0.8% the retention rate. So it's a really small number. Thank you, thank you, I appreciate it. The last question, uh, is it possible to estimate the size of the lesion? It, it's the same like the position where the, the lesion is. You, you need some experience, um, but we have not built in in the software a measurement system. Yeah, You can okay. estimate it and it's the same now. I can, can tell you the same with the, the first tumor case. I thought it was smaller than I've seen it by enteroscopy. Thank you, thank you. Any further questions? Can I ask you, Mr. Pakowski? Yes. Uh, uh, what was the longest uh, period of delay uh, capsule in days in your practice, in your big practice? Um, the, the longest, uh, we've, we've had a lady, there was a, a capsule inside over six months. She had no time to come for enteroscopy. So around six months, maybe seven. And I have another patient I tried two times without a benefit to, to catch the capsule and to get it out by enteroscopy. And then we, we said, okay, we tried a third time and at this time the capsule was gone. So. And this was over a period of three or four months. So as I told before, we have time. Don't hurry, don't be, don't be very afraid about the capsule retention. We need some weeks, maybe months, and the, the problem often is solved on its own. Thank you very much. Okay, one, one last question. Is it important for you, the real-time vision? Only in an emergency. Emergency, in emergency, it would be good to see we have now an ongoing bleeding. Yeah, and to, to estimate in which area this could be. Uh, I can say I use it maybe in 10% of the, of the capsule, so it's not so much important. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that brings us to the end of this session. I thank Dr. Pakowski and Dr. Korniv for taking the time to present for all of us. It was indeed wonderful having all of you here. Uh, we will be sending the recorded presentation shortly to all the attendees, and we thank you for your time. That brings us to the end of the session. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.